Thank you. As we come to worship God, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 5, it says, And the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. We're going to sing our first hymn on the sheet. Remain seated as we sing. There is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing day. you and we praise you that there can be a great and tremendous hope that burns within our hearts. We thank you, O Lord, for a great expectation because we look to you, because of you. Father, we praise and we worship you, O God, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you that you are a great and sovereign God. We thank you that in life's chaos, we thank you, O Lord, in the uncertainties. Lord, we praise you that we come back to you. And we thank you that there is nothing that takes you by surprise. And we praise you. We adore you. We uplift your name. We uplift the name of Jesus Christ. We praise our God. We worship Jesus Christ. We worship your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that this hope in the Lord Jesus lifts our weary head. Father, we often get weary with many, many things, not least with our own sinfulness. And so, Father, we thank you for this great optimism and hope, O oh Lord, that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. How we praise you immensely. How we give you worship, O oh God, that you ever sent your Son. Father, we give you praise incessantly for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that he is heaven's best. 
We thank you, O oh God, that he is the Lord of glory, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And how we adore the adorable Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you, O oh God, that he is your beloved Son in whom you are well pleased. We thank you that you say of your Son, he is daily my delight. And Father, we pray that we would be like you and delight in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we would truly love our dear Saviour. May we be like that psalmist in Psalm 45 that says, My heart is bubbling over with a good theme. And I recite my composition concerning the King. May our hearts this day be bubbling over with that good theme of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be worshipping our dear Saviour. Oh, Father, we praise you for who he is. We thank you for what he has achieved, and especially on Calvary's cross. Oh, Father, we cannot thank you enough that your just wrath for our sin fell on Jesus. Father, we thank you for forgiveness of sins. We thank you that we have, when we trust Christ, that biggest issue sorted. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can be accepted before you in the beloved. Oh, gracious Lord, we bless you for forgiveness of sins. We praise you and we're thrilled, Lord, when we hear those words of the Lord Jesus. Your sins are forgiven you. Father, we thank you that we can have peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray as we come to worship you, we ask that you would help us to focus upon you. There are many things that have taken up our attention over these past days. And Father, we pray that we would put them to one side and that you would give us concentration. We ask that you would give us focus and that we would focus in our souls. We find it difficult, Lord. We find it difficult to focus on the Lord Jesus. We're quite earthbound, Lord, and, and we think about the passing things of this life. And Father, we often make that a priority. But Lord, we pray that we would truly, at this time, focus upon those spiritual realities. That we would set our mind on things above and not on things of this earth. We ask for the help of your Holy Spirit, Lord, for we cannot think on you and worship you and love you without him. And so, Father, we pray that he would come as a gracious dove upon our time and that you would have all the glory and all the praise. So help us then. And we look to you. May we be like the psalmist that said, my eyes are ever toward you, the Lord. May our eyes be ever toward you. So give us grace. Be calm and be very kind to us, Lord. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's open our Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Reading from verse 46 to the end of verse 52. Mark, chapter 10. Reading from verse 46 to the end of verse 52 page 894 in the church Bibles. Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 46. 894, let's hear God's words. Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timotheus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? 
the blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Now don't worry, really, and I mean this sincerely, if you've forgotten. But last Tuesday, I was a year older. I don't know about a year wiser. <laughs> but a year older. And Lucy very kindly gave me a new mobile phone. Now on the cover, it did not say, welcome to the 21st century, Ben. <laughs> okay? But it's a new mobile phone. Have your mum and dad got one of these? Oh, I bet they have. It came with a nice little cover, isn't that very kind and updated model. You know, the, the old one, you have to wiggle it about to get it to charge up and everything else. Uh, so, new mobile phone. There we go. One, have your mum and dad got one of these? Do they update it often? Do they get a message? Do they get messages? Do you ever do you see them f a few times, maybe throughout the day, that something goes bing, and then they look at it? Not a few few seconds after, isn't it? And then look at what they've got. Do you find that? There's a message. Do you know, it's a bit like the message of the Lord Jesus. You know? Do you know, just like people get a message on their phone, there's a message, and it's the best message you'll ever hear. It's the message of the good news of the Lord Jesus. And there are different things that you can do, and if you haven't got one, you will probably have one one day, and you'll understand about what you can do with messages. Now, you can get it, and it has to get through to the phone. Sometimes there's a message that doesn't get through. And someone might ask, did you get me message? Question is, have you got the message? Have you got the message? Have you got the message about the Lord Jesus, about our, how our sins can be forgiven? Different things you can do. You, you need to get it, first of all. You need to hear it. We need to hear the message. How shall they hear it? They need to hear the message, all right? You need to get it, receive it, this message. But they could ignore the message. Do you ever do that? How ever do that? Ignore the message. Get it and ignore it. There are some people and they sadly ignore the message of the Lord Jesus. Think it's an irrelevance. Don't want to know. Ignore it. You can ignore the message, can't you? You can change the message. You could say, I don't like that very much. And so you can edit it and you can change it. You can wipe bits out and you can put bits in. And sadly, not everyone teaches the good news of the Lord Jesus. They change the message. And sometimes people say, oh, we don't like the fact that Jesus offers forgiveness. That means take our sins away through the Lord Jesus. We want to do it our way. And so they teach us that you've got to work hard and you've got to do it yourself, but we can't. It's a gift from the Lord Jesus. So they change the message. Many change the message. Suit them. Don't want to do that. It's not authentic, is it? It's not what, what's original. There are some people, and what they do is they delete the message. Let's, let's just delete it. We don't want to know it, and they don't want to be, our inbox to be filled with that, so they delete the message. Oh, there's somebody that delete it out of their mind. Don't want to know it. Delete it. There are some that say, have you ever gone this one? I really ought to reply to that message. And you know I'm really going to do that one day. And I really am. I'm going to reply. I've got to do that. I've really got to do that. And then hours turn into days, and days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and guess what? Do you think the message ever gets sent? Do you know, people do that with the Lord Jesus. That's dangerous. It's dangerous. So, oh, it's all right. I really ought to respond to that message one of these days. I really ought to do it. Do you know, I get some people and they say to me, I really ought to come to your church one day. Never seen them. <laughs> Some people, years, have really ought to do that. I really ought to. Some people say that. I really ought to get round to it. And days, they turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and months turn into years. Never do it. Never do it. Oh, I have to respond to the message in a timely way. There are some people and they respond to the message negatively. Oh, I don't like it. this message. Oh, no. Oh, I don't like that. Reply. Pfft. Give them peace in my mind. Don't like that. And that's what some people do with the Lord Jesus. They respond negatively to the message. Don't want to know it. Oh, I wouldn't do that. But what should you do? Respond straight away. The Bible says now, by the way, is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. 
today. Today. Now, respond to it straight away. Some messages you get through, respond to it straight away. Without delay. Oh, that you'd respond to the message of the Lord Jesus today. Today. While it's called today. Don't know about tomorrow, do we? But we know about today. My times are in the Lord's hands. Respond to it positively today. And respond to the message of the Lord Jesus. Different things you can do with the message. Or different things that you can do with the message of the Lord Jesus. Question is this. What one of those things will you do? What one of those things will you do with the message of the Lord Jesus? I'll make sure this is on aeroplane mode <laughs> on silent. All right. Great. Well, you think about that, the message of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. We're going to pray for Margaret. Her arm's playing up. When she went to the doctors, I took some x-rays. So she phoned me last night and she said she might not be here today. We're going to carry on praying for her. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the message of the Lord Jesus. We really thank you that he has said, all who comes to me are by no means cast out. We pray, Lord, that we would not delay in coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that we wouldn't ignore the message. We pray that we wouldn't delete the message out of our minds. And we pray, Lord, it wouldn't go in one ear and out the other. We ask that we wouldn't say, well, I really ought to do that one day and never do. Father, we ask, O oh Lord, that we would strike while the iron's hot that we would come to know the Lord Jesus while it's today. Oh, Father, we pray for people to respond to the message, to taste and see that you, the Lord, that you are good. Oh, Father, Lord, we pray that you would help us to carry on responding to the Lord Jesus. We thank you so much for brothers and sisters in this place, Lord. Thank you for Margaret. We pray for our sister today. We pray for her in her ongoing pains. Father, we ask especially for her arm, Lord, that you would really help her. We pray for these x-rays as they come back to give her clarity. And Father, we ask that you would be with her in her spirit. Thank you that she's still joyful in you. And Father, we pray that you would greatly bless our sister for your glory. Do her good, Lord, in her home today. We pray. Lord, watch over us as we preach your word. We pray that your word would have a striking and a lodging place in our hearts. Father, we ask that we would do what the Lord Jesus said. Blessed is he who hears the word of God and keeps it. Lord, may we not just hear it, but keep it. May we not lose it. May not one word fall to the ground of all the good things that you have spoken. Father, we pray that you would cause us to be attentive and listen with our souls to what you would have to say to us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and do us good. We pray for those who witness for our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we do pray that you would truly, O oh Lord, break into people's hearts. Thank you for prison ministry. And we pray for those in this fellowship who go to Wakefield Prison other prisons across this country pray for daylight that you would greatly help their work and we ask that prisoners would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour and Lord. Watch over us we pray. Speak to us through your word and help us for Jesus sake we pray. Amen. Let's sing our second hymn number 345 345 Spirit of faith come down, reveal the things of God, and make to us the Godhead known and witness with the blood. Tis yours the blood to apply and give us eyes to see. Who did for guilty sinners die, has surely died for me. Three, four, five. <laughs>
We're looking at the incident that we read a few moments ago. It's a glorious incident. It's wonderful. And it's about blind Bartimaeus. And the great thing about it is it's the symbol and emblem of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's given to us on a plate. It's a picture in, in gold painting, in bright colours of the good news of our great Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at it. Now, normally we have about two or three headings. Sometimes we might have four. Very occasionally we might have more than that. Well, today we've got a whiz. We've got eight headings, okay? So I'm really hoping that I'm not going to spend the same amount of time on each heading as I would normally because we might be here for a long time. So eight headings. We're going to whiz, but it's about this great thing of gospel lessons from a miracle from our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go. Number one, we see there's a predicament. We're going to meet a man in a predicament. Number two, we're going to see a plea. He cries out. Number three, a put off. Number four, perseverance. Number five, we're going to see a prospect. There's a prospect. Jesus stands near. Number six, a presentation. Bartimaeus presents himself. Number seven, a petition. And number eight, a procurement. Number one, there's a predicament. There's a predicament. Now, what's the big thing that's going on here? Jesus is on a journey. Where's he come from? He's come from the area of Galilee, from the north. Where's he going to? He's going to Jerusalem in the south. And on the way, there are different incidents that happen en route. And here's one of them. And he's come to a place called Jericho, which is northeast of Jerusalem. About a day's journey, day's walk from Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So he's very, very close. Now, why is he going to Jerusalem? Why is he making this journey from the north to the south? Well, it's his final journey before he dies. The gospel accounts slow everything right down the nearer he gets to the cross until it's almost minutely when he talks about all the incidents of the cross because it's so important about the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you benefited from the cross? He died for our sins and he rose again. And that's our twin pillars and that's the message that is the heartbeat and the engine of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. The death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He's going to go to Jerusalem to die. This is going to be the most momentous of all events in human history. The death of Jesus Christ. Well, he passes through this city of Jericho. He comes out on the other end. Who's with him? There's the disciples, and there's also a great crowd that's with him as well. And by the side of this dusty road, this highway, this busy road, this main road, there, not an unusual sight, there's our man that we're looking at. He's got a problem. He's got a massive problem. What's his problem? He's blind. Our heart goes out to him, doesn't it? You ever seen blind people? Our heart goes out to him. So, so poor, what a precious gift sight is, isn't it? We use it every day without even thinking. We take it for granted, don't we? When we wake up in the morning, that there we are, and we're going to see. Take it for granted that we can, can read. This morning, you didn't have any problems, did you? Following on in the reading, you used your eyes, and you saw the, the letters and the words on the printed page, but this man couldn't. He couldn't open a scroll and read it. He couldn't see that glorious sunset over Jericho that happened, I guess, from time to time. He couldn't see the faces of his family and of his friends. He's completely blind. He can't see. Can't see at all. And what this man was like physically, the Bible says, we are like naturally, spiritually. Might not like to admit it, but we are. We're spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, verse 4, says this. The God of this age, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. And it's true. You talk to a non-Christian about Jesus, and you rapture about him, say, he's great. Oh, what a wonderful, say, so look at you, and look at you, with a glazed look over their faces. Just another person in history, isn't it? 
Or you talk to them about the cross. And you say, oh, it's great that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And that he died for my sins. Oh, that's good for you, isn't it? And I see it. They don't see it, do they? There's a veil over their face. They can't see it. They can't see the preciousness of the Lord Jesus. Maybe you're like that. Just as there's a veil over your mouth, as to you this morning, there's a spiritual veil over our eyes. We can't see it naturally. Blinded to the things of of Jesus Christ. Now there's another problem with our man. Because of his blindness, he can't work. There's no incapacity benefits in those days. There's no social security. He can't work. How's he going to get his living? How's he going to get across? What's he going to do? Well, he sits by the side of this busy road where there's more people that are going to go by with a begging bowl and he's going to beg. And that's him. Every day, Begging. Imagine that for a job. Hoping, the hoping that someone is going to spare a bit of change and put some change in a begging bowl. He's a beggar. Now again, it might not be very comfortable to us, but it's what the Bible teaches. That by nature, we're not spiritually great. We're beggarly. We're spiritual beggars before God. And we've got to understand that before we ever appreciate the good news. Before we ever appreciate that the Lord Jesus and why he came for sinners. We've got to start here, haven't we? About our natural condition. It's no good Martin Mayer's living in denial, was it? It would be no good him walking around and saying, well, you know, I'm not really blind, am I? As he fiddles about and tries to find his way. Oh, it's all right. Everything's all right, really, isn't it? It's no good doing that. He had to admit his need, didn't he? And we need to know and feel our need before God. No point of winking ourselves and saying, everything's all right when everything is not all right, can we? We shouldn't do it. We've got to face up to it. We're spiritually in a predicament. We spiritually are. Secondly, there's a plea. Now, there was a massive problem with Bartimaeus' eyes, but there wasn't any problem with his ears. He could hear quite well. That's good. And he has heard about this person called Jesus. And he's no doubt heard about how he's had compassion on others. He's heard about his heart. He's heard that he's gracious. Have you heard about the Lord Jesus? Have you heard about the compassion of Jesus Christ? Have you heard about the the wonderful things that the Lord Jesus has done? He's heard. And in fact, as we're going to see in a minute, he knows quite a lot about Jesus. He knows where he's come from in terms of his physical ancestry. He's heard about that. He's kept his ears to the ground, as it were. He's, he's, He's had his ears open. His antennae, if you like, has been up. He's blind physically, but he hasn't given up hope of life, has he? He's been thinking, and he's been hearing. And he hears about this Jesus, who he's heard about before. He's walking down the street, the very road that he's begging on. And he thinks, whoa. Hang on a minute. You can imagine him. The the clogs twirling in his mind. If Jesus has been compassionate to other people, there may be a chance he's going to be compassionate to me. There may be a chance that just as he's been kind and healed other people, he might just heal me. You never know. So what does he do? He cries out. Now in our spiritual predicament, of being blind and beggarly by nature. What must we do? We must cry out. And he tells us who he cried out to. He says, Jesus. He didn't cry out to the disciples, did he? He didn't cry out to the great throng that were there, the great multitude, the great crowd that were compassing Jesus about as he was going up to Jerusalem. He cries out for the one who can help him. Now you imagine there's two blind people, two two drowning people, and they're drowning, and one of them sees a boat in the horizon. Now he's not going to cry out to his mother mate that's drowning, is he? He's going to cry out to the one who can help him. He's going to cry out to the man on the boat. Now we can't, now nobody else can save us. There's no family member, there's no minister, there's no anybody else who can save us other than Jesus Christ. The only Christ can save you. There's nobody else in the whole world that can save us. However religious they are, however good they are, the best is they can point you to Jesus Christ. 
It's Jesus that's going to save us. This Bartimaeus is clever. He's not calling out to anybody else. He's not calling out to his disciples or the crowd. He's calling out to the one who knows he can help him. And that's what we need to do. We call out to the one who can help us. To the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, he says. Saviour. He can help him. And Jesus can save you. He's a saviour. He says his title, Jesus, son of David. Like we say, he knows exactly where the Jesus has come from. He's heard. Oh yeah, I've heard of David, King David in Jerusalem all those years ago. We've heard about him, that great king, that man after God's own heart. And there's this line, and, f- and through that line, back through the family tree, and forward we see Jesus has come from David, the son of David, the Messiah, promised. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our Righteousness. He comes from the line of David. And throughout the Old Testament, there's a promise about the Lord Jesus. And Bartimaeus capitalizes on the promise. He knows there's going to be a Messiah and he's going to come from the line of David. And he says, Jesus, son of David. Now, when it's my children's birthday, without fail, my auntie, we're back on mobile phones again and messages, she sends me a message and she says, a parcel is on its way. Every birthday, Every Christmas, without fail. She tells me, right, she sends it up from Kent. She says, it's my dad's sister. She says, right, there's a parcel on its way. Now I know that in the next few days, after that message is sent, there will be a parcel that will come through. 139 Fox Royal Lake. I know it. It will be. And if there isn't, it will be, won't be a problem with her honesty. It will be a problem with the postal service. She wants me to text back and say, it's come. She says, a parcel, a gift, is on its way. And in the Old Testament, you can summarize it in three words. He is coming. That's what you can say. He's coming. The gift is on its way. And he doesn't lie. The Lord, and he says, Jesus is on his way. All throughout the Old Testament, he's coming. And you have all the different clues, like a jigsaw being built up. And he comes. Have you capitalized on it like Bartimaeus? He didn't have the advantages that other people had. He didn't see any miracle. He's blind. But yet he knew exactly that this Messiah was coming. That Jesus, son of David. Wow. He got it, hadn't he? When lots of other religious people who could use their eyes and look into the scrolls of the Old Testament didn't get it. Son of David. The promised one. And he cries out. Now, isn't the cry amazing? Because what does he cry for? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, that's not what he normally cried out. Now, Bartimaeus knew all about crying out. That was his job. He sat by the road begging, crying out. But he didn't cry out for mercy normally. What did he cry out for? He cried out for money. But now he's crying out for mercy. Before he would say, spare any change. But now, what's he saying? Have mercy. Have mercy. He's realizing that Jesus can have compassion and pity on his state. And we need to come to for the Lord and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on Have compassion on my poor state spiritually. Because I can't save myself. I've got nothing to offer you. I can't put anything on the table myself. I've got nothing to offer you whatsoever. Our good deeds are like filthy rags before you. Have mercy. We look for mercy, don't we? For compassion on the Lord Jesus. So we've seen there's a predicament. Bar Timaeus. His name means son of Timotheus. Bar means son of. And Timotheus is a name of his father. Son of Timotheus. That's what his name means. He's a blind beggar. He's in a predicament. There's a plea. Thirdly, there's a put-off. What are the crowd going to think about this man? who's crying out to Jesus. The crowds are following him up to Jerusalem. The Lord, 
What are they going to think about this situation? What are they going to think? Are they going to be favourable? What's going to happen? They try and put him off. They try and tell him to be quiet. They try and tell him to hold their peace. They tell him, look, 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 just be quiet, will you? He's not going to be interested in you, is he? You know, this famous Jesus and his famous spread, he's not going to be interested in you, you little beggar. Just, just look, just play it bluntly, shut up. That's what they were saying to him. Shut up. Look, 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 look. Don't cry out like this. You're causing a scene. Be quiet. And have you ever noticed there weren't just one or two people telling him to be quiet? What does the passage teach us? There were many that were telling him to be quiet from the crowd. Think about the pressure that Bartimaeus was to belt up. Think about the enormity of the, of the strain that must be on Bartimaeus. It would have been the easiest thing in the world, wouldn't it, for him just to have been quiet. Many were telling him, be quiet. Don't call out like this. He's not going to be interested in the likes of you. There's a put-off. And you know, when we want to know the Lord Jesus, not everyone's going to think you well of you. Not everyone's going to embrace it with open arms and think, oh, that's wonderful, you know. Do you know when people come and you tell them, oh, I'm thinking about trusting in Jesus. You know what? I really love the Lord. They'll try and put you off. Oh, you don't want that, do you? You're getting religious. Oh, they spoil your fun, don't they? Oh, they take away your Sundays. Oh, you don't want any of that. Oh, no, 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 no. And they'll try and put you off. They'll try and silence you. There's a man in Broadstairs, he used to be in Broadstairs, and, and he said about his conversion once, and he got saved, and he went home, and he was full of the joy of the Lord. Who wouldn't be when our sins are forgiven? And he, and he had that great joy, and he went home, and he told his dad, and his dad was looking at a newspaper, and after a little while, he put it right over the top of the newspaper, and he said, that won't last. Well, after years and years, he's a pastor of a church, as far as I know, in Skegness. And it did last, but he's put off. Ah, you don't want. You don't want that. You don't want to do that. There's a lovely man. He's with the Lord now. He's called, Ver some of you knew him, Werner Rye. Lovely, godly man he was. Never had the privilege of meeting him, but knew people that know him well. And he was in Leeds University. Very, very clever man. Very gracious man. And what he would do in his lunchtime sometimes is he would go into Leeds City Centre and he would set up an open air board and he would preach in the open air. And the big wigs of Leeds University, they walked by and they saw their colleague Werner having a preach about Jesus. So they called him aside and they said, look, Werner, this isn't the done thing academically. We don't do this sort of thing, you know. Just, just look, look, please, you know, you're not giving the university a good name, are you? Just, just stop doing this about Jesus, will you? What's Werner going to do? The next Wednesday, you know what he did? He set up his board even earlier. And he was going to preach. And I'm told that he would have got his professorship a lot earlier if it hadn't have been for his Christian convictions. Isn't that interesting? It didn't matter to him. Because he loved the Lord. And he wanted to tell people about the Lord Jesus. It was a put off. But then here we go with a perseverance. What's Bartimaeus going to do? Is he going to be put off? Is he going to listen to the crowd, to the many that are calling out to him? Be quiet. Don't cry out to this Jesus. Is that what he's going to do? Not a bit of it. He's not going to be put off. It would have been so easy, wouldn't it, for him just to have said, well, you know, here am I. Let's just be resigned to my condition. Here am I, and I'm a beggar, and I might as well just get on with it. I might as well just be a beggar for the rest of my days. There's no chance I'm going to ever get me sight back. Here's all the crowd that are so much better than me and they're so much more influential. And even if Jesus did hear me, he's not really going to listen to me, is he? And I might as well just be quiet and get back to me begging bowl. It would have been so easy for Bartimaeus to have done that, wouldn't it? It would have been so easy for him just to have been quiet. But he didn't. He kept on going. He cried out all the more. You weren't going to shut him up. You weren't going to, you weren't going to do that. You weren't going to put him off. You weren't going to silence him. You weren't going to do anything like that. He was going to not be deterred. He was going to cry out for Jesus. He wasn't going to miss this opportunity. This was a once in a lifetime chance. And Jesus is passing by. 
This is it. And I'm going to grab it with both hands. I'm going to take the ball by the horns. I'm going to strike while the iron's hot. I'm going to cry out to Jesus. And I'm not going to be deterred. And he cried out all the more. Is that you? When your friends say, ah, don't get religious. And we're under enormous pressure by others. And we will be. Oh, you don't really want all that stuff, do you? I'm tempted to say, oh, maybe we don't. And to be like those stony people, just after a bit of persecution, just give up for the word's sake. Is that going to be us? Oh, don't be put off. Don't be put off. People will try and put us off. Don't be put off. Years and years ago, there was a minister in Leicester, and his name was called William Carey, and he was a shoemaker, but he had a tremendous heart to reach people across the seas, the heathen, and from the nations. And at one Christian meeting, he got up and he said, listen, what about the poor heathen across the world? And this is what a Christian minister said, and this is disgraceful. Sit down, young man. If the poor and heathen will hear the gospel, God will do it without you and me. Well, what was Kerry going to do that? Minister told him that? If that was us, we would have said, ah, oh, forget it. The elders and betters have said that. That's not what he did. He got, on a, he got on a ship and he had nothing but hassle on the voyage all the way over there. He hardly saw any blessings when he was there in the first few years of his ministry. And in hardship... He preached the gospel to the Indians. He wouldn't be put off. Oh, don't be put off, friends. Don't be put off. Don't be. For spiritual things, carry on going. Bartimaeus, he carried on going. He cried out to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've seen there's a predicament. We've seen there's a plea. We've seen there's a put off. We've seen there's a perseverance. Fifthly, there's a prospect. Verse 49. What's going to happen next? What's Jesus going to do? Is he going to pass on by? What's going to happen? Do you know, sometimes when I read stories to Jemima, and you have to be like Nigel Mansell, you know, when you read stories to her, because as soon as you pause, even just to pull the page, she goes, yes, yes, yes. What happens there? Yes, yes. Whew, give me a chance just to turn the page, love. You see, she wants to know what happens next. What happens next in this story? Yes, Jesus, what's he going to do? Is he going to pass by like the crowd thought he would? Is he going to have no time for this little, this little beggar on the side of the road? Is he just going to carry on in a cloud of dust and go on his way to Jerusalem? No, what's he going to do? He's going to stop. And he's going to call him. And it's funny, isn't it, how the crowd change sides as soon as they hear that Jesus stops and calls him. And they say, look to, to this lovely phrase at the end of verse 49. Be of good cheer. Rise is calling you. Wow, what was going on in Bartimaeus' heart? Jesus has stopped. Jesus has heard my cries. He's calling me. Oh, we can be of good cheer when the Lord Jesus calls us. Do you think that Jesus isn't interested in your cries? Do you think Jesus is so big and he's in heaven and he's so glorious and I can't see him with my physical eyes and how all of the people in the world, how on earth will he have any dealings with poor me? Do you ever think that? He does, you know. Do you think that he's changed? Do you think that somehow now he's in heaven he hasn't got any more compassion on people or somehow his compassion has diminished or somehow he doesn't really hear the cries of those who call out to him? Oh, no, 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 no. He does exactly what he did then will do to you now. He stands and he says, come here. Be of good cheer, they say to him. Rise, he is calling you. Christ calls us. He calls us. Have you heard the call of Christ? He calls us to come to him. There's a real prospect. Is he now going to be healed? Jesus is interested in him. And Jesus is interested in you and me. He's deeply interested. Never think that Jesus doesn't care. Jesus cares deeply for your never dying soul. He cares more than anyone in the whole world, does the Lord Jesus. He doesn't take pleasure in sending people to hell, friends. He's willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's not a mean taskmaster. He's not hard hearted. He's not our Ebenezer Scrooge at the beginning of the Christmas carol, is he? He's got compassion. And he's got love. And he's got empathy. And he's like Scrooge at the end of the Christmas carol, if you like. Isn't he? He's c concerned for this poor blind beggar. He's calling him. 
Of all of the masses of people that are there, he takes notice of Bartimaeus and he takes notice of you and me and he's interested. A presentation. That's verse 50. That's the next thing. And there's another lovely phrase. Verse 50. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. How lovely. Can you picture it? Picture that scene of this blind man taking off his garment. Perhaps he needed a bit of help to, to go over to the direction of the Lord Jesus. He throws aside his garment. Throws aside. That's what's going to hinder him. And oh, isn't that a picture and an illustration of what we must do? You know what it says, doesn't it, in Hebrews, after the writer, to stir up faith. He talks about all these different characters in the Old Testament, about how they've had faith. And then he says, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. You don't see an athlete coming with a coat of armour, do you, on him, ready to run the 100 metre race. He's not going to break the world record doing that, is he? He comes there with a strappy vest on, doesn't he? And then the really thin trainers and... He's not going to be in his hobnail boots. He's going to throw aside everything in the changing room that's going to hinder him. And that's all you and I must do. Throwing aside his garment. He came to Jesus. Oh, that we'll do this. Are there things that hinder you? Sins that hinder you. And it's not just sins. He says, throw aside every weight and the sin that so easily hinders. It's not just sins. It's the things that lead to sins as well. Are there things in your life and mine that just to be honest with you, they might not be wrong in themselves, but they're just hindering us. They're slowing us down from coming to Jesus. Oh, throw aside the garment. Throw it aside and come to Jesus. What a phrase that is. And came to Jesus. There's Jesus in all his splendor. And there's this blind man in all his beggarly outfit. Perhaps he's got clothes that are torn away and we wouldn't really think twice about him and we wouldn't look upon him and, and, he, and he's a bit threadbare in his clothes and, and he looks a bit of a state and he ain't washed for, for days on end and he's pongs a little bit and he doesn't know what Lynx is. And then he, but he, he comes to Jesus. What a glorious thing it is when Jesus welcomes this beggar. And Jesus welcomes us in all his glory and in all our sinfulness and throwing aside his garment. He came to Jesus in that presentation. He presented himself to Jesus. What about you? Have you come to Jesus? Have you thrown aside that garment of sin and come to the Lord Jesus? What he did physically, have we done spiritually? And if we keep on doing it, haven't you got need to come to him today? I have friends. Oh, I'm a sinner. Say it freely. You know it. You can see my faults. They're gaping. And I, isn't that true of you? It's not one of us here that hasn't got remaining sin. The good that I would, I find evil present with me. Haven't you? But, oh, coming to Jesus. He takes away, he's so compassionate, and takes away that sin. Have you come to him? Oh, do you keep on coming to him? Keeping on throwing aside the garment and keeping on coming to the Lord Jesus. There's a presentation. Seventhly, there's a petition. Jesus called for him. Now Jesus speaks to him. He was calling for him and now he's speaking to him. Verse 51. So Jesus answered and said, what do you want me to do for you? It's interesting, isn't it? That's exactly the same question that we saw last week in a different context to James and John. Read verse 36. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And he says exactly the same thing to these people. What do you want me to do for you? To blind Bartimaeus. What a difference that was between James and John, who should have known better, and here's poor Bartimaeus. He wanted the top dogs, top positions, pride. Oh, yeah, that we would sit one in your left hand and one on your right in your kingdom. What a difference is Bartimaeus. He says, Rabboni. That's the most politest, respectful form of addressing a superior. It was a high term of honor, official title of honor. Rabboni, it means my Lord or my master. He's so humble as he comes to him. He realizes he's not worthy of Jesus. Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. He's so respectful. He's not demanding. He's not saying, listen, come on, give me my sight. Where is it, Jesus? Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. He's so humble. That I might have my sight restored. 
That's the petition. He says, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Have you ever asked him that? Have you ever said, Lord, I'm blind, I can't see. Lord, I don't know the way forward. Lord, I'm proud. Lord, I'm sinful. Lord, I don't know. But please forgive me. Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever done it? Have you ever said, Lord, that I might receive my sight spiritually? That I might receive my sight spiritually. That I might see. And then eighthly, we've seen there's a predicament. There's a plea. There's a put-off. There's a perseverance. There's a prospect. There's a presentation. There's a petition. And now there's a procurement. Verse 52. He's healed. Instantly. Verse 52. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And here's Mark's favorite word, immediately. He received his sight. Maybe, who knows, all his life, who knows how many years he was blind. But blind he was. In fact, in, when, it, when we're introduced to him in verse 46, it's actually in the original something of a title. It's Bartimaeus the blind, literally. That's the title for him. If anyone thought about Bartimaeus, that's what they thought. Oh yeah, that's Bartimaeus the blind. That's what characterized him in other people's minds. That's the first thing they thought when they thought of Bartimaeus. He's blind. That's what they thought. And now he can see. And now he can see Jesus. What about you? You can see physically. You can see me and poor you. And I can see you. But can you see spiritually? Can you see the Lord Jesus? Has he opened your eyes? Can you say with that blind man in John 9, one thing I know. I don't know a lot, Lord. I don't know all the intricacies. I might not know all the theological depths. But one thing I know, though I was blind, now I see. Or Newton, when he wrote Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Is that your testimony? Is that your story? Is that you? Once I was blind, but now I see. And he had faith. That was what it was, as Jesus commended lots of people for their faith, like the Roman centurion and others. He said, your faith has made you well. Your faith. Faith. Forsaking all I trust in. Faith. What about you? Faith. It needs faith, don't we? Faith in the Lord Jesus. What did Peter say to these believers that were going through the meal? He said this, Having not seen, you love. Though you do not see him. Yet believing. Yet believing. You have faith. We've never seen the Lord Jesus. Never seen him. But we have faith in him. Do you have faith? The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. This Bartimaeus had faith. There's so many disadvantages, but what he did is he opened his ears and he heard about Jesus and he had faith. Oh, friends, let's have faith. Let's cry out to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. Let's have faith. Faith that the Lord Jesus will do what he says he will do. So you know, when we go down to the doctors and the doctor says, oh, you've got this, we don't say, oh, have we? Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, are you having me on? We take them at their word, don't we? And Lucy says to me, oh, I've been doing this today and I've been doing that today and I've been doing the other today. I don't say, oh, have you been doing it? No, I don't. I trust her. Don't you? Well, we do it with people less, less important. Why not do it with Jesus? Don't doubt him. It's an awful sin is unbelief, isn't it? Don't doubt him. If Jesus says, when you come to me, I'll give you rest. When you come to him, I'll give you rest. It's as simple as that. Don't say, oh, does that mean me? And oh, No. Forsaking all I trust him. Forsaking all I trust him. I come to him in simple faith. In simple, don't complicate it. In simple, heartfelt faith in Christ. Come to him. Tell him as it is. And say, Lord, please have mercy. And Bartimaeus, he didn't, just, he didn't go his way, you know. What did he do? He didn't go his way. He followed Jesus on the road. He became a disciple. He wanted to gratitude toward Jesus, follow him. And what about us? When we're saved, oh yeah, we want to follow the Lord Jesus, don't we? We want to follow him. We want to serve him. 
We want to say thank you with our lives for living and dying for us. Here it is, this great, great gospel picture. This great gospel picture of the good news of the Lord Jesus. My dad was once preaching, and at the end, there was this man who used to sit at the back, and his name was Fred Piddock. He's with the Lord now. And I don't suppose he was a particularly academic man, but he loved the Lord. And my dad just simply preached the gospel that day, and he came up to my dad at the end, and he said, I love the gospel. He said, I love the gospel. What about you, friends? I love the gospel, don't you? I love the gospel. Never tire of it. Never, oh, another gospel message. It's not teaching. No, I love the gospel. We love the Lord Jesus. We burn with a love for him. And say, Lord, I love you. Lord, please come in to a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love him because he first loved us. Have mercy on us, we say. And he welcomes us. And he receives us. And it takes us all the way to glory. Gospel lessons from a miracle. Let's sing our last hymn, number 522. 522, a hymn of testimony to the Lord. Lord, I was blind. I could not see. In thy marred visage any grace. But now the beauty of thy face in radiant vision dawns on me. Number 522. We're hopeless without you. Father, we are nothing without you. Father, we bless you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he opens our blinded eyes to make us see the wonder of who he is. Oh, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We pray that we would be like blind Bartimaeus and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me and receive Christ into our souls even again, and know the joy of the Lord Jesus. Bless us, we pray. Dismiss us now with your favour, for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs>